Hello, everybody. I am Raina from Garden District Bookshop, and I just want to say thank you so much for joining us tonight for our event with Nathaniel Rich and Thomas Beller. Um, the video you were just watching was finished just a few hours ago earlier today. So that sort of a trailer and sets you up for the book we're gonna talk about tonight. Uh, we are here with Nathaniel Rich and he has multiple books. His book, Odds Against Tomorrow has been a staff favorite here since before it was published. And we constantly have it in our staff picks. And his two most recent are nonfiction, Losing Earth, which if you haven't read this, you need to do that for yourself. And the book we're talking about tonight, Second Nature, actually doesn't even come out until tomorrow, but um, Scenes from a World Remade. And this book will absolutely make you second guess the world around you, your kitchen, <laughs> your... Um, the beach, your world, your entire world from, yeah, it's your own, your own intimate environment all the way up until the bigger picture. And we have plenty of these in stock and Nathaniel is going to come sign them for us as well. So if you would like to place an order for our personalization, I'll put the link in the comments for that this evening. And we are in conversation, or Nathaniel is in conversation tonight with Thomas Beller, who's the author of four books himself. He is a professor of English at Tulane University and has, uh, he's a contributor to the New Yorker and the New York Times and Vogue and many, many more. And I'm not gonna take up any more of your time. I'm gonna step back and let Nathaniel and Thomas take over. If you have any questions though, for either one of them, post them in the comments. There's gonna be a Q&A at the end and they will get to those and answer all of your questions. So here we go. Nathaniel and Thomas. Hello. Hello. Can you Hi hear me? There. Do we have audio? Can I get some nods in the great public? Nodding right. <laughs> the vast world of interesting interiors. Um, Nat, thank you for having me as your first uh, interlocutor on your virtual book tour. Thank you for joining me and thank you all for, for coming out. I know um, if anyone has the approaching the levels of Zoom fatigue that I do, I, I am grateful for your uh making it tonight and sorry that we can't do it in person but um but yeah there's some some um satisfactions of this form too so we'll try to take advantage those of you who are joining us i think the appropriate emotional uh position to assume for this is that soon this will all be in the past this in fact will be one of the last zoom virtual book tours and you'll feel um somehow you'll find a way to feel nostalgic for all this so enjoy it while you're living through it. Um, let me say a few words to introduce Nat Rich and say a little bit about um, my relationship with him for lack of a better way of putting it, which I find, um, I don't know, I wanna talk about it. Um, Nat was kind of a rumor to me for many years. Uh, he was physically occupying spaces that I had occupied. He worked at the Paris Review on White Street in downtown Manhattan down the block from a an office I had with a literary journal called Open City. Um, and he had moved through the city um, to landscapes that I was very familiar with. I, I came to understand, uh, but not at the same time, because he's a bit quite a bit younger. The most extreme example of this um, sort of overlapping contrails effect between us and that if things become uncomfortably personal. Bring it on, that, you know. Start gesticulating wildly, but. <laughs> Um, I'll text you. I've been trying to figure out how to phrase this in a way that's not too possessive and I'm not even going to try. So Nat's father moved into my mother's building and our neighbors and for all I know, sitting 20 feet away from each other through a few walls, both watching this. So I'd like to say hello to my mother, Nat's um, parents and um, send my love, in fact. So that said, uh, Nat, I was reading this book which is a fascinating mixture of incredibly scrupulous reporting and focus on the other, <clears throat> but it does in silhouette start to paint a kind of portrait of you and your interests. And uh, it suddenly occurred to me at some point 
that in the list of books that you've done, there's a title from early on uh, called San Francisco Noir. Here it is. He, he, and um, as you'd expect, it's about um, noir films from the 40s to the present set in San Francisco. And I thought, oh, I see. Because there's, there is some connection between the sensibility that is unpacking, particularly in the first section, which you call crime scenes, um, the, it, there's a strong atmosphere of a, you know, of a whodunit, you can imagine. It's a kind of Maltese falcon that Humphrey Bogart could be your protagonist in a number of these. Could you tell me how you go from being interested in noir film, let alone noir film set in San Francisco, to the preoccupations of this book? No, no, um, <laughs> I, I, you know, that, that's a book that uh, I wrote when I was 24 and very eager to um, have a job that would allow me to write full time for the first time in my life. And now, you know, my advance was extremely low, but it was enough, you know, living at that time, um, as as you know frugally as I was to to basically last six months or ten months um, in a cheap apartment in San Francisco and start to write what became my first novel um, as well as that book. But I think in terms of the sensibility, the noir sensibility, the sense that you know there's there a sense that you know the odds are rigged against you that um, an eye for sort of darker conspiracies. Uh, a, a sense that uh, you know the the more one tries to get oneself out of out of a mess, the worse it often becomes. I guess that would be the through line to this <laughs> to this book. Um, the first, yeah, the first stories in the collection uh, in, in Second Nature are about um, people who are turned into a kind of uh, crime detectives um, against their will. Um, people who discover these stories of just profound um, malfeasance uh, committed by basically by humanity against the natural world in some regard. And, and they're forced to really reconsider everything that they've known and, and thought and, and assumed about the world. Uh, so I think, yeah, I think living at this moment in time, in this era, um, at a time in which there's nothing uh, identifiably natural about, about the natural world, um, you know, this is, this is the theme of, of the book. And I think, in, uh, you know, where uh, there is a noir element, there is, there is a kind of crime story element. And, and, and I think a lot of us are often are thrust into this position of trying to figure out what happened, you know, who put us in this mess, um, who's responsible, who should, who should be blamed. Uh, and so, uh, of course, the ultimate revelation um, is that usually it's not so simple as just apply, uh, assigning blame to a single person or entity, but but that there's there's blood on all of our hands to some extent. Right. It's almost like the words. It's Chinatown. I'm, not I'm sorry. Am I? Are we okay? I got some funny audio. Good. Can I get more affirming nods? Can you hear me? Thank you. Thank you, Eamon. Um, yeah. It's as though every piece in this book could end with the unstated phrase. It's Chinatown. Um, let me go into an even more Baroque personal note. So I mentioned that Nat and I had a sort of shared landscape of childhood at different times and young adulthood even. And then they converged here in New Orleans, which is when I've got to know him. Uh, so everything I know about his youth, I know from stories he's told me as an adult. And uh, as he just mentioned, uh, the nature of, of the real or the authentic or the natural is something that recurs uh, in the book. It begins the in introduction with a very comedically surreal situation in which there's a, a beach in the West Coast filled with sea glass that um, a man decides he wants to replenish by breaking man-made bottles and then throwing the glass onto the beach on the argument that that's what sea glass is to begin with. It's an unnatural thing. So this should be considered a natural, an act of natural preservation. And it ends with this very Baroque, frightening piece about a glow-in-the-dark green rabbit, a genetically engineered rabbit to glow. Uh, the, one of the payoffs of which is the epiphany that um, all the sense of outrage about this genetic modification is old news and has been going on for decades. And it's just manifested in a way that's shocking, but it's actually, there's nothing new. And these seem like a very 
the result of the product of very philosophical uh, mindset, Nat. And I started to think, maybe aided by the author photo that went out with the ad for this reading, I started to think of you in this kind of, you know, shtetl environment, you know, like in a Talmudic, in a state of Talmudic examination. <laughs> In, yeah. in connection with that, I wanted to ask you, and again, you know, please feel free to, to pass. What happened in Hebrew school? <laughs> uh, that's easy. I got kicked out. I don't know if that answers your question in one well, way or the other. Well, it answers it in a kind of legal way, but can we have, you know, can you feel like I'm in a writing class? Can you, you know? Yeah. The, <laughs> right. Now, I, 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 I always like sitting in on, on your, the two lane, your two lane classes. Um, the yeah, I got kicked out. I'm from a long line of um, Hebrew school um, dropouts, false yeah students. Um, I, you know, I think um, <laughs> where to begin? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that like the, the I, I guess a lot of these stories in in this book started you know before I, I started reporting some of these stories as, as many as I don't know nine or ten years ago I think, and at first I didn't know I was writing a book certainly and what i what drew me to a lot of these or really all of these stories from the beginning uh was a sense of just uncanniness or creepiness uh, unease you know when i when i you know come upon a story that just made me feel that way uh that that felt unresolved i found myself wanting to to write about them and and i it was only later really after i I'd, I'd written a few of these that i started to put it together and be able to largely because of the interviews I did with people who have been thinking about these these subjects um, in a lot greater you know depth than I had, uh, I was able to put a language to it and and I was able to understand that what was what was fascinating me and or disturbing me um, often had to do with this this question of of natural and you know I think it was really crystallized for me by the, this interview I did with Ben Novak who's this young scientist who's at the heart of this effort to bring back extinct species um, that's led by an uh, organization called Revive and Restore that was started by Stuart Brand, the founder of the Whole Earth Catalog and his wife, Ryan Fallon. And, you know, there in a conversation, he said, um, you know, I, I asked if, you know, what about this? This is unnatural to bring back the species that no longer exists. And, and he made the very, you know, sort of now seemingly obvious point that, well, there's nothing there's nothing natural at all. Um, the forests that we think of are essentially human creations already. They're, they've been uh, designed by us often, you know, through neglect or malice um, or carelessness. But you know, they've our activities have shaped them the way they're shaped. They've the ecosystems have been uh, shaped, influenced, you know, greatly, often in disastrous ways by our activities and so on. And so. You know, a story like the Glass Beach, which I came across on just a road trip one time, is, was so perfect uh, for this idea. I mean, I never wrote it, didn't write a whole story about it, but it's in the introduction of the book where there's this beautiful glass beach in Fort Bragg, uh, Northern California. It's a huge tourist uh, attraction. I think the, 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 the biggest tourist attraction in, in that part of Northern California, which is one of the most beautiful places in, in the world. And, and it's just a, it's a beach that used to be a garbage dump. Locals called it the dump. And, and yet uh, it was beautiful or considered beautiful because it was filled with this beautiful um, glass, the sea glass that was essentially old, you know, parts of cars and radiators and, and, you know, Tupperware from the 1940s and fifties uh, when it was a dump. And what was fascinating about the effort to, you know, and then people would take the glass as souvenirs over, over the years. And this effort to to restore the beach um, was led by this this very bizarre sea captain who has the local um, sea glass museum in town. He's probably personally responsible for taking hundreds of pieces of glass from from the beach. And his appeal was, um, we should use the language of the the California. Um, you know, state environmental protections that say that it's the responsibility of the state to restore um, natural beauty whenever it's it's uh, you know is deteriorates or is, is affected by human activity. So he was making the case that um, it's the ecological thing to do. It's the natural thing to do is to yes to dump more glass on the on the speech. And I in these stories over and over again, um, I kept finding 
these this tension between you know what is sort of intellectually um, the right thing to do when you consider an, an issue, a complicated issue at great at great uh, depth, and then what what you know feels like the right thing to do in your gut, and and they often um, don't work together. And so I've I've tried to write stories about that intersection of those uh, two things, and it's usually um, yeah, one's first brush with 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 a lot of these stories or mine was a sense of just like creepiness, uncanniness, a sense that something was wrong. Um, and and uh, so it came out of a desire to understand why 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 this was. Yeah, you know, if I may, you know, in a sense, there's a little bit of a noir quality to that feeling of uncanniness, where like the hero, the the hero detective, is peeling back the edge of something, and it's much bigger and more complicated than he first thought, and that is a similar beat. There's something else in this book that you capture that I really responded to, um, which is this almost impossible situation where you, you, you at one point refer to the human race as a show me species. You know, we, we're responding to things that we see, but there's a lot that's going on that we don't know about or that we can't see. And often you have a situation where an individual is sort of up against the machine. And a lot of your protagonists are individuals. They're maybe in some cases, lawyers or scientists who are put in the position of the the Marlowe character or the uh, the Jake Giddies character. I'm sorry, I'm imposing, I'm leaving San Francisco and Noir and hitting Los Angeles, but I feel there's a strong West Coast theme. I should be allowed that. So I wanted to um, just allude to and talk to you a little bit about one passage that I was, I just loved and found very evocative of the larger project. And I wanna share it with you and just hear some thoughts about how you came to it and so forth. And it's in the piece that you wrote um, called Here Come the Warm Jets, which is about a very affluent community on the West Coast that um, uh, an airborne toxic event involving methane uh, took place in the community. And it, it, there was a lot of, uh, this was an unusual situation where there were actual immediate symptoms in some people and there was a whole freak out and other people had a response that was terrifyingly familiar from even our recent COVID episodes where it was almost identical. They were like, what's the big deal? You know, it's, everyone's overreacting. Um, one person you quote, this is a non sequitur a little bit, but I can't help it, it's so great. There's one, at one point, someone who's basically the COVID denier of the uh, here come the warm jets piece starts saying like, look, you know, come on, everyone's overreacting. It's a lot of foolishness. This is a quote, this is not Fukushima. Everyone's out to get the gas company. The hysteria is proportional to the number of lawyers coming to town, says this one COVID denier type guy. He then it goes on to say he conceded that his wife, who was recovering from cancer, could quote smell it quite well, and was concerned. Her oncologist advised her to leave. And that I must say is typical of something that often happens. This incredible drollery in this book, like you're sitting here, like this dude is being. It's like it's no big deal, and his wife is writhing around on the floor, dying of cancer. Her, oncolo her oncologist is saying, "Get out!" And he's saying, "What's the big deal with a few nosebleeds?" This is not my question. I want to ask you about the passage that goes like this on page seventy-nine. This is where we. I didn't even go to Hebrew school, but I'm trying to get in the spirit. So you know, please feel to consult the text. Um, the leak is two days in. Well, the person that, who uh, Nat is interviewing has made a phone call to the Southern California Gas Emergency Hotline. If you smell gas, said an automated voice, press one. Pakuko pressed one, that's the person's name. After a bar of Kenny Loggins, nobody but you, a representative picked up. Huge shout out to Nat Rich for getting the hold music a part of modern life I feel is under discussed, the suffering that we all must endure while being put on hold with the bank or other, the healthcare provider. The music they hit us with, I feel, has been very calculated to torment and undermine our well being. That's, a, and I feel, you know, Nat, maybe this could be a subject. May I have the nature of your emergency? Comes a voice. What's this smell of gas outside our house all night long? I'm not sure, sir. May I have your address, please? He gave it. We're next to the SoCal gas storage facility. There was a pause. This is the voice on the phone speaking. It looks like they were releasing gas into the air in that area. 
than the person on, who's made the phone call, releasing gas and making us sick. Natural gas is non-toxic, sir, is the response. Then the guy said, do you know why I'm calling you? Because on your website, it says, if you smell gas, evacuate and call 911. And then the guy from the SoCal gas company says, because there could be a gas leak, not because it's toxic. I'm getting sick and my girlfriend's getting sick and I got four cats throwing up. Okay, well then you're having a reaction to it, but it's non-toxic. I'll stop there, it goes on. It's like a beautiful Samuel Beckett Baroque play, it gave me so much satisfaction to see one of these bizarre, torturous phone calls to the 800 number from the bank, the hospital, the electric company be dramatized in its full absurdity. Could you tell us a little bit about this beat in your book, how you arrived at it, what you make of it? Yeah, I mean, I. so the, this is one of the, you know, strangest stories. I mean, as you said, it's sort of like white noise meets, you know, comes to, um, wealthy Orange County. Oh, it's actually part of Los Angeles, Porter Ranch. Uh, <clears throat> it's a community that until this disaster was probably best known as as the place they shot, Steven Spielberg shot E.T. Um, sort of ranch houses going up up the hills. Um, and it's uh, it was the site of the biggest climate disaster um, in recent American history, where this this giant mountain that they're all perched on these these million dollar houses um, had been emptied of of, uh, of of originally of oil um, and was now had been filled with natural gas as for use as a storage um, tank essentially for for greater Los Angeles's natural gas needs and there are a bunch of wells that are like these uh, straws plugged into the mountain and one of them just uh, burst uh, it had a leaky valve. Uh, I think they ultimately determined, and, and in three months, the amount of gas that leaked out of of the mountain um, was greater than the total greenhouse gas emissions of something like 50 countries. I list a lot of them. Um, it's, it was essentially the global output of, of Lebanon that year. Um, but nobody in the community really cared at all about the climate impact of of the leak, all they worried about was, understandably, was whether they were getting sick, and whether they were getting sick is the subject of this ongoing, all these lawsuits, and it's and the question is a little bit um, murky. And so, what I kept encountering in the community as I, I spent some time there in the middle of the leak, you know, it was this like t bizarre social experiment um, that, yeah, does have some elements of of what's happening now with COVID, but. Um, but this was even sort of less direct because everybody, you know, their response to the gas depended not just on, you know, their expo level of exposure or where they were on the, on the slope, but essentially who they were as people. Uh, and so neighbors, you know, even within households, a, a husband uh, would be in bed, sick, um, despairing of gas poisoning, and the wife wouldn't notice anything and be going about with her days. And you saw these 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 wild splits and um, exactly like behavior. COVID. Yeah. What's that? Just like COVID. Yeah, I guess I'm wary of <laughs> extending the metaphor too much. And yeah, but there's some of that. Uh, I mean, another detail, like my favorite version of that was a guy, uh, this these forty something uh, couple who are saying, yeah, this, it's no big deal. Like all these people are just trying to make a buck. Um, you know, every time I see someone with, uh, I have a running joke. Every time I see someone with a, with a nosebleed, um, we say, oh, it's the gas. And I, I, you know, I later, I thought I should have asked him, well, is it weird that you're seeing people with nosebleeds so frequently that it's become a running joke, you know, in your family. Um, but yeah, then I, 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 I was able, I, I felt like the, to tell the story, um, to, to answer your question, finally, to tell the story uh, well, I needed to be sort of in the lives of these people in, in an intimate way, that it was not enough just to, you know, report on what people were saying, um, or the lawsuits or the science. Um, I had to get inside these people's lives. And I was fortunate enough to find enough people who would let me in, um, which is my always to my eternal surprise as a, as a reporter that people say yes. Um, but enough people did. And, uh, and so what I came away with is this, this sort of portrait of, of, this, of this community um, that felt very much to me also like a portrait of, 
almost a parable um, of where we're at and how how we're able to think about something as diffuse and abstract as climate change, um, which is, you know, we're not really able to think about it very well, except for, um, you know, the easiest way we have is to is to um, make it tangible and make it, um, you know, define the, you know, the hurricanes and the the floods and the, the human suffering. Um, but it's it's very indirect and difficult, and I think that's what the people in this community were were really struggling with and unable to 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 ever figure out. Yeah, the the show me problem. <clears throat> I can't help but digress for just a second to say that one of the pleasures of the book, Matt, is you're very good at marshalling <clears throat> a great deal of facts, and the facts are evocative. And this particular piece actually has this list that I loved reading, in which Nat has. Um, explaining the scale of the methane leak and, and the fact that during the four months that this methane was leaking, uh, it contributed, I'm quoting, contributed roughly the same amount of warming as the carbon emissions produced by the entire state of Connecticut. If it, if it was its own country, it would have contributed to global climate change at a rate exceeding that of Senegal, Uruguay, Bolivia, Laos, Latvia, Lithuania, Zimbabwe, Albania, Nicaragua, Panama, Jamaica, it goes on includes Jordan, and he says, would rank somewhere in the end between Lebanon and Syria. And I was so grateful to know that that means that Lebanon is actually much bigger than Jordan in the emissions rankings. Why, why were you grateful to know that? I don't know, it just excited me a little bit. Like I just thought that they were the same thing, but actually, no, I guess it makes sense. Lebanon has a port, Jordan's over there. And these were, there were a lot of these peripheral pleasures that popped up in that, in that mode. Um, let me take a swerve because I see the great Said Serifizadeh, uh, the, an author that both Nat and I have attached ourselves to slightly as editors and whose glory we are sort of drafting off of periodically. He's asked a question in the chat and I want to put it to you, which is, yeah. I'm bringing you up noir and your interest in noir. And he says, uh, does your fiction writing influence your nonfiction writing in terms of storytelling? Yeah, well, thank you, Saeed. It's a good question. Um, I should say Saeed also accomplished in both fiction and nonfiction. Um, I, I, you know, I, I really, um, you know, I don't approach them with very, very differently. And I, I think a lot of what my writing on, on these subjects has been driven by is a feeling that a frustration that, um, you know, writers aren't I mean, it's changing now in the last few years, I think, but I, I have felt that um, not enough serious writers are taking on these subjects uh, in narrative. You know, you have excellent uh, journalism, you know, first person journalism about climate change, about environmental issues. You have the sort of naturalist tradition, you have memoir, um, and then plenty of, you know, science writing. Um, and 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 God knows political you know political writing, but what we don't have um, is really any narrative writing. Um, there's not, uh, and it, it strikes me as a huge um, a huge empty space, uh, not just in the literature but really in the culture. That um, you know you think of other major crises, um, you know, or cultural moments in in recent American history. I mean, to take one imperfect example, you know, the civil rights era, you have, you know, a whole literature of, of you know, political writing and, and essays and so on, but you have this, this also this huge outpouring of novels and, and narrative nonfiction, I guess we call it now. Um, and the reason that I think that that's important, I think, is because it's, it's really through narrative that you have the best way to get at this place where um, these great public crises touch uh, one's the, our personal lives, our, our intimate lives, our inner lives, and and I think through storytelling you can really go deeper if if you have you know characters and and um, especially if it's an intimate form of storytelling where you get into people's thoughts and and fears and and hopes and so on, and you're able to track the way that um, you know these public events touch one's inner life and not just in the most, you know, the most obvious dramatic ways, um, you know, someone getting harmed by a natural disaster, say, but, but sort of the more insidious um, ways of, of, you know, how does it, I mean, I think of in, like my generation, certainly, you know, how does, how does one's um, thinking about having children, how has that been affected by 
uh, the specter of climate change and this, you know, planetary degradation? You know, how does it change our faith in in our institutions and democracy, um, and and so on? And so that's where I've tried to address. Um, you know, that, that that's what I've tried to write um, through stories. I, I take myself out of it entirely. There's no um, there's no I, and that this is something that I'm often fighting with editors when I'm publishing pieces for magazines about. Um, I really try to resist being a character, and um, and and so it's it's uh, it's a certain kind of writing that I feel like I I want as a reader to have more of, and and so I felt like the least I could do is contribute in that way. But um, you know, I think the same is true in in fiction as well as in non nonfiction, and and we're only starting to see I think more sophisticated, involved um, efforts by writers to to tell these kinds of stories. Um, and I think I think we'll see more of it. But but it, it I have felt that there's it's just not a, a not enough that that's addressed what I think is the major um, transformative um, story of our our time, which is this completely drastic transformation of our our relationship with the planet. I have two questions. Um, I also want to leave some time for you guys to write in the chat some questions that Nat could uh, address. I see David Michaelis, author of this fantastic biography, Eleanor has one. Um, but I want to ask at least one of my two, uh, because in a way it closes the loop when I talked about uh, Nat and I having similar geographies in New York City and Manhattan down to an actual building. Um, now we're both in New Orleans, Louisiana. So. I wanted to ask you, Nat, about the effect of moving to New Orleans on your thinking in life as a writer. I know you've incorporated it. In, it's been a huge subject for you in your novel, King Zeno, and in a series of pieces here where you're talking about coastal erosion. So that's a kind of literal answer. You know, it's provided material, it's provided the geography, a new topography to examine and, and work with as a metaphor. But personally, what's it? what do you think it's meant to you as a writer to leave New York City where you grew up and where most of your writer friends and your young writer life took place and uh, and which had been a subject matter for you and moved to this other town. What's that? Yeah, that's I, I would love to hear your answer to that question, Tom. Um, but luckily, I asked Especially as someone who writes so much about New York, yeah, as, as you do. Um, and so maybe you could get, get a glimpse of your answer after, after I go then. But um, the, I mean, for me, I felt, Originally, that my impulse was just to get outside of of New York and be a little bit outside of that that world and have some distance from it. Um, and I felt I feel like my experience since has has uh, shown that my instinct was right. I mean, I, I I felt that I feel like when you're, you know, what's important. One thing that was really important to me from a writing standpoint of being in New Orleans is, uh, and part of one, you know, what I love about the city generally is is how it's not it doesn't really care about New York um, or really most anywhere else. And I find that extremely liberating. And I, I couldn't imagine really living in a city that was looking over its shoulder at New York, at New York and had, had a bone to pick or you know, chip on its shoulder about the city. And, um, and that's most cities in the country, I think, as far as I'm concerned. And, 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 and here, I think there's a lot more freedom um, to sort of pursue whatever you want to pursue and not not feel um, the influence of other people. Now, you know, other writers thrive on that, the, the, you know, the friction with, with all of the other writers in New York City, but I've, I've found that being outside of it has been useful um, and healthy, frankly. Um, but yeah, certainly, you know, and then you come across stories like the Coastal Master Plan, which I think to this point, to this day is still, um, though there's been some national, major national coverage over the years, I still don't think most people in America realize that the world's biggest climate change, you know, I guess you'd call it climate change mitigation plan is happening right now in the US in Louisiana, where the state um, in a, you know, a red state has unanimous support, almost unanimous, I guess that's some something of the subject of the story um, for for building land on this sort of continental scale, rebuilding the coast. Um, and of course, part of the reason that people don't know about it is the state never uses the term climate change. And it's really fascinating to read. You know, there was a recent uh, editorial by the, the head of CIPRA, the coastal um, body within, the, within Louisiana, um, who is 
arguing, you know, explaining why we need the master plan to rebuild the, the marsh um, to protect New Orleans uh, in the southern part of the state. And uh, the whole column, he doesn't mention climate change. And when he talks about the reasons that the state is eroding, um, he only refers in passing to uh, something like, you know, and some other man-made, um, some, some garbled phrase, some ma man-made, you know, decisions uh, where he's actually referring to um, the actions of the oil and gas industry for the last century, which, you know, by its own reckoning is responsible for more than a third of the destruction um, of the of the marsh. And so there is this sort of funny dance and you see it all through the 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 the, the plan, which nevertheless is this extremely ambitious plan that is in, in many ways a kind of model for the kind of um, government policy that we're going to need and we're going to see more of uh, in these these major responses to to climate. Um, so yeah, that's sort of the both the cultural and the and I guess the direct my direct answer. And, and so I, I find there's there's so much so much happening here that um, you know for all the city's reputation as this like backwards, Ha you know, haunted by the past, it's it's actually very futuristic in some critical ways. That that in in, in many cases, especially ecological um, uh, areas, this Louisiana is actually on the vanguard of where we're going. We're we're sort of having the battles that we're the rest of the country will have in the coming decades. Yes, there's a lot about living in New Orleans that uh, presents its a kind of the frog in the boiling kettle you you're in it but you hardly see it like the grand mitigation that Nat referred to that's apparently happening on the coast also has a more municipal version in which all these houses I think for real estate reasons as much as flood reasons but they it's a wonderful fascinating visual spectacle in New Orleans where they just sort of jack a house up like you're changing a flat on a car, except you build out like a kind of hatch pattern of of four by four uh, pieces of wood or eight by eight or whatever they are, and you just literally like elevate elevate the house and build a whole new, you know, turn a two story house into a three story house, and you kind of drive around and every now and then there's a house up on blocks essentially, like uh, it's going to have its tires changed, but. Um, yeah, the houses in Plaquemines have been sort of growing with every storm; they grow another ten feet. Yeah, you know, I guess I feel like I, I'm just going to allow myself this incredibly rude moment. I love the book, Nat. I'm really upset that you didn't put the Plaquemines piece in the book, the ones with the, the coal dust. The coal dust. Uh, not coal. Oh, that's, that, it's in there, just in a slightly oh, revised way. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Reconstructed form. Okay. Well, listen, um, let me give uh, some airtime to David Michaelis's question, which is a good one and give a shout out to Eleanor, the biography. Is the extinction of the passenger pigeon a part of the book? It is, I can attest. If so, is it a story of wanton extermination like that of the American bison? Or is there another yet darker element that you've uncovered? Yeah, that's a, um, well, thank you for joining the chat, first of all, um, to David McAllis. And, and I would say that uh, there is a darker element that, um, I don't know if darker is exact, darker, might not be the best term for it, but what's fascinating um, about the so there's this effort to bring back the passenger pigeon. There's it's the it's the lifelong obsession of this scientist Ben Novak, um, who's younger than me and has been you know his whole life has just been devoted to saving the species that was once the most populous bird species in the continent, if not the world. You'd have flocks of of literally billions of birds um, that would take days to pass overhead, um, and so he wants to bring them back. And uh, what's fascinating and that it took a while to kind of get to the bottom of in the reporting, strangely, was that, you know, he's actually not trying to bring back the passenger pigeon. Um, you know, the genetic, the technologies are advanced uh, enough that we can reconstruct its genome or, you know, the genome of a bird, a passenger pigeon, uh, pretty well, not exactly. Um, and so what they're trying to do is actually create a new bird, a human made pigeon uh, that will be essentially a combination of what we think to be the genetic portrait of the passenger pigeon and, um, and what we know to be 
um, the profile of of another pigeon that's that's around today um, that's that's different in in some significant ways from the passenger pigeon, but but is the the closest genetic cousin, and so. Um, actually, they're creating a, 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 you know, Ben Novak's bird that he is now, after many years of doing this research, has changed. Um, he finally said, actually, we should call it the new. Um, he has a new Latin name for it, and it translates as the the new wandering, uh, the new wandering pigeon of of North America, or something like that. And, you know, this is another example of this this sort of eeriness that I think you often encounter when you you get into these stories of of just profound you know genetic intervention or intervention in general with the natural world um as an effort to to restore some wrongs and yet um the argument is actually pretty you know coherent and and makes some sense it's the idea is that this pigeon the passenger pigeon is not only an important member of the, the north american you know forest ecosystem but was actually the architect of North American forest, that its activities, largely destructive, stimulated the growth of, of the original North American forest. And that in order to restore these forests, we need to bring that back. I mean, it's a little bit far-fetched, but it but there's a through line there. And and the most fascinating thing about it is that the whole the whole thinking um, that underpins this movement of de-extinction, which of course includes woolly mammoth, which again would not be a real woolly mammoth, but a, a elephant, human made elephant that sort of looks like a woolly mammoth, um, is that, you know, they're tapping into um, really the, the, the thought that is the foundation of the environmental movement. They're, they're tapping into the basically the beginning of conservation thinking. So their references are to people like Alexander von Humboldt, um, or George Perkins Marsh, um, John Murr, certainly. And so they're, they're going way back. And that, that sort of you know that you don't see that when you hear a lot about you know other kinds of futuristic technologies where you you imagine you know scientists um, you know playing around in a lab and getting giddy about their powers. They're, these they're actually talking about using these technologies um, in service of this this uh, almost like pr pr primeval uh, in terms of environmental thought uh, um, way of thinking, and so. I think there's something there, and I and I think what they're doing, they're doing something that that I think we're going to have to do as a as a society ultimately, which is, um, you know, once we acknowledge these powers that we have, and once we acknowledge that we can't just let things drift as we have, um, we have to not just talk about the kinds of solutions or the you know the kinds of projects that we're going to bring back uh, or initiate, but also you know what are the principles that are animating those choices? You know what are the values that we're trying to um, that, that will guide us. And, and so in that way, I think that those, those folks are actually on, onto something. Um, I want to come back to the New Orleans angle just briefly, Nat, and, and give you as what you asked in terms of my take. Yeah. Um, but it does lead back to you and your work. And my, my take about the experience of having moved to New Orleans uh, even with repatriation on a regular basis is one of incredible gratitude in many different ways. But one of the ways is just uh, being in this sort of outside the fort, unprotected space, um, which for better and for worse is the occasion for a kind of con consistent level of adrenaline as though you're in the forest or <laughs> not in New York City, you know, you're not safe. Um, and an example of what I, what I mean by safety, which in the Louisiana context might evoke uh, the topic of crime, for example, I would go back to the issue of semantics that Nat mentioned in this column about why we're spending billions of dollars to erode the coast and somehow avoiding explaining why the coast was eroded. Another version of that that flashed across the national stage recently was when Joe Biden used the word cancer alley in a the actually more, the more enlightened, if you could say, of the two Louisiana senators got very upset about the phrase Cancer Alley uh, as a term. Um, the distress was not about the phenomenon of these former plantations along the Mississippi River being these carcinogenic dumps where people were very sick. The, the distress was this disparaging phrase. Um, things like that, seeing that up close is uh, alarming, but interesting and um, 
I have to give a shout out, by the way, to a talented student of mine named Reagan Ulrich, who's somewhere in this, I think, and who's doing some fascinating writing as a native of the territories I was just referring to. Um, so that's that's where I am, Ned. I'm I'm really grateful to be here, but it's it's not really the most relaxing place in that way. You know, it, in fact, yeah, the way I've rationalized it is, you know, that famous Saul Steinberg drawing. You know, I feel the like I'm one of those tiny dots, and I'm looking back at Eighth, Ninth, and Tenth Avenue. Um, that's my point of view. So I'm still New York is I, I'm like a Hungarian emigre in New York City in the 70s who still has the old country with them, except now I'm in New Orleans and the old country is New York in the 70s and 80s. Yeah, I think it's good to I think it's important to to be, you know, at least to feel that way, you know, that that you're sort of a little less control, a little bit more on the edges of things. And I think and you know, and the other part about living here as as a, a native New Yorker is that no matter what you do, you will never, you know, be accepted as a New Orleanian locally, which is I've made my peace with and is is fine. I mean, um, you know, I remember going to get my homestead exemption, which is a tax a tax thing um, that that New Orleanian uh, homeowners have to do, and and I showed up at City Hall with every piece of proof that I was a resident of New Orleans and the state of Louisiana, and driver's license, utility bills, and home deed and all the rest and and the the clerk said you know um where are you from and i said well i'm born in new york but as you can see you're holding seven pieces of of you know legal proof that i i am a resident she said yeah you're in new york <laughs> and i felt like yeah that's that's all right you know i'm i'm okay with that um but did you and, get the homestead so, exemption yes very uh reluctantly i was yes given the the, the exemption but the um you know, so that's that's the other part of it. It's like you're outside. You might be outside of New York, but you're also sort of outside of New Orleans. And 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 so, I think that I embrace that to some extent. I mean, I, as much as I love I love the city, and I feel, you know, I've I've I have a lot of you know very strong connections here, and feel part of a, of a community here. And yet, there's there's always a sort of level that you won't ever this shibboleth you'll never get past, which is essentially like where did you go to high school? Question you'll never be able to answer the correct way. And I think that's okay. And I, I, I like that feeling you of mean being people in New Orleans aren't going to be thrilled to hear you went to Dalton. That's not going to fill them with warmth. That's... Oh, let's not go there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they, you know, the, 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 I've, I've gotten far enough uh, in that conversation to, a, I guess before you get to the high school thing, there's also where you hear, have you been here since Katrina, Katrina yeah. dividing yeah. line. And, yeah. and, and we so belong probably, to this weird generation of people who moved here after Katrina, but maybe right. a little before New Orleans became the subject of Saturday Night Live skits about how cool it is and people want to go live there. Yeah, we'll never get, right, we'll never even get to pre-Katrina level credibility. So It's almost like you're an honorary member of Gen X now in this sense of being kind of in between. Welcome. I am, I'm in that like one year slice of in between generations, so you know. Listen, like a psychoanalyst, I feel the need to point out that we're coming to the end of an hour. Um, I don't want to take over the closure of this. I do want to remind all of you people that are out there that if uh, you wanted to type out a remark, oh, someone has. Nope, what they've said is wrap it up. Okay. Um, moments to go. Raina, should I turn it to you? Nat, I, don't, I want to give you the last word. Okay. Um, wait, we just have a last minute question here from Andrew. Um, there's a possibility for humanity to realize we all live outside the fort on the one planet, or do you feel social stratification of risk and exposure too ingrained to overcome? Classic last minute question, by the way. Good I question. salute you for that <laughs> question. <laughs> the meaning seconds. of life yeah. in two minutes and then no, we can- No, that's a good question, Andrew. I mean, I think is what level of realization is possible I, I guess that's not for me to say. I mean, I feel, I feel like at a, at a certain, you know, I'm pretty despairing when you get to big questions like that, you know, will we have a political revolution in this country that will bring about the level of, you know, change necessary to, to um, keep global warming under two degrees or something like that. Um, you know, it's hard to get too optimistic about that. On the other hand, I do feel there's a deep desire um, to in, at least ask some of these questions or engage with these questions more. And I think a lot of the eeriness of, 
of these these encounters that I think we all are having increasingly with these just sort of bizarre, um, uh, sort of they're almost like um, you know beacons from the future, whether it's de-extinction um, or genetically engineered, you know, rabbits genetically engineered to grow uh, to glow green. Um, you know, the eeriness we feel is in part um, comes from the fact that we haven't really had this. Con- we haven't talked about what's happening in a, in a in a deeply enough or engagedly enough and so when something or for that matter you know when there's like eight natural disasters in a row it, you know we're all upset by it and disturbed by it but it we haven't really had that conversation culturally and and you know i'm generalizing but i i do feel there's there's an unmet um desire to to try to understand what these things mean not just for the state of the planet but but what they mean uh for us in a very personal sense and so um, those are the stories that I'm, I'm telling. They're, they're stories about people who are having that um, encounter and having those, asking those questions. Um, but you know, like them, I don't, I don't have the answers. But, but my hope is to at least ask some of those questions. Well, I am going to jump in here, guys, and say thank you so much, Thomas, Nathaniel. Thank you very much for joining us tonight and sharing your book with us. Thank you for having us and, and support Garden District Bookshop. Um, it's just, it's my, it's the best, a wonderful institution. And um, yeah, and we'll uh, maybe, and you can visit now with a mask. And you, you can, we're, we're open, social distancing, wear a mask. Nathaniel's going to come sign his book. So come buy it from us. You can come in person, get it from our website or give us a call. And thank you all for joining us tonight. Thank you, Tom Beller, also. Thank you, Nat Yes. <laughs> Good night. Okay. Good night.